Well, good morning to everybody. Good to see you. Glad to, uh, to know that we are together worshiping the Lord and trusting him for all good things. Today we're going to look at Matthew chapter 26, and if you have your Bible, turn to me, turn with me to Matthew chapter 26. If you uh, are in the pew and there's a pew Bible in front of you, Matthew 26, it's on page uh, 1416. And so uh, I appreciate you uh, following along. Let us pause and ask God's blessing upon his word. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we can feed on your word. We thank you that you're the God of the past who has rescued us from all sin and that you have come into this world to die on the cross. We thank you you're the God who feeds us today, that as we gleam from your word, that you are the living bread and the written word and the living word speaks to us so that we can grow in our faith. But we also know that you're the God of the future and that you will accomplish all that you have set out to do. And we pray that even this hour that you would accomplish your will and purpose in our lives, that our hearts would be open to what you have for us, that we would uh, be hearers of your word and doers, that we would study your word, that we would pray for insight, that we would obey, that we would obey, and that we would share. You know our needs, our deepest needs. You know where we stand with you. Our lives are an open book. There's nothing hidden from your eyes. And so may your word hit home in the core of our being that we might reflect on where we stand and uh, what's important in our lives and that our desire is to have a hunger for you that's deeper and sweeter with each passing day. And so you're the God of this moment And so we give you this moment, this moment of time. We are your children. You are our heavenly father. So embrace us in your love and speak to us for we want to hear. We want to live lives that please you. Thank you for what you are doing and what you will do through your word this day. Amen. Amen. Well, in Matthew chapter 26, in verse 14, then one of the 12, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and asked, what are you willing to give me? What are you willing to pay me for this Jesus? And so they counted out 30 silvers, silver pieces of silver, 30 coins, and um, gave it to them, him, I would suppose. And uh, then Jesus, I mean, Judas watched for an opportunity He watched for an opportunity to hand him over. Life presents us with lots of opportunities. You've had all kinds of opportunities this week. And how we respond to the opportunities depend on what we really love and what we really really like and what we want to see and look for in life. The Jewish leaders looked for an opportunity to destroy Jesus. They wanted to put him on the throne. He was a threat to them. Because the Jewish leaders lived life on the outside. It was external. And if you've come to our Bible studies in the book of Matthew, we've gone through the Sermon on the Mount, and it's all about external. But God says, let's get to the heart of the matter. And so we look at our hearts. The Jewish leaders look for an opportunity to destroy Jesus. Jesus looked forward to an opportunity to obey God and please his Father. It says in Hebrews 12 that the joy that was before him, he endured the cross. And we are to fix our eyes on the finish line, for there is still distance to go. He wanted to give his father glory, so there was an opportunity to give him glory. And sometimes the very best gifts that God gives us are not things, but the the best gift that God gives us are opportunities. Opportunities. Yes, what we call adversity and opposition and difficult times and sickness are also opportunities because they're from God and God calls us to opportunities. So Jesus looked forward to the opportunity to be with his disciples. We are in the setting of the upper room and even though he knew that one of them would betray him, he looked forward to being with them. Another would deny him 
before the rooster crowed. And in the garden, everybody would scatter. Yes, he looked forward to being with them. It was his last night, his last evening, because the next day he would be on the cross. Can you imagine what happened in 24 hours? They were having a party, celebrating. They go out to the garden. He gets arrested. He puts on trial. Three by the Romans, three by the Jews. Innocent man, he's on the cross. And by that night, it's over. Somebody from the Sanhedrin comes and gets his body, puts him in a tomb. Everybody's shocked. Everybody's shocked. What happened? What happened? Two guys are on their way to Emmaus, and Jesus shows up, and they don't recognize him. And they talk about these things, and Jesus said, what are you talking about? Well, haven't you been around? Don't you know what's happening? One of the 12, Judas Iscariot. I mean, I even hate to say the word, one of the 12. He was on the inside. He was chosen. He was taught. He was empowered. He saw the miracles. Three years, three and a half years, day in, day out. Now he's going to put a knife in the guy's back? That's what Judas was going to do. Judas' betrayal shows that he was not a true believer. The scriptures say that he was the treasurer for the twelve. He must have had some sense of integrity because they allowed him to handle the money. But they kind of knew that, you know, there's a little hole in the money bag and money seems to disappear. So why did he go to the Jewish leaders? Well, maybe he was of greed. Why would one of the inner friends be going to betray one who treated him with every blessing from heaven? Maybe um, Judas Iscariot uh, was involved in a group called the Zealots, and they were re rebellious, and they wanted to overthrow the Roman government. So maybe Iscariot has to do with the Zealots. Iscariot in Latin is familiar word with dagger. So there may have been a dagger or he may have revealed his heart. I don't know. It could be that Iscariot comes from a village, Kyrios, and that village in Sutton, Judah. So he's the only Judean. All the other disciples are Galileans. And by the way, there were two Judases in the 12. There was Judas Iscariot and there was another Judas that was there. Judas, the lesser Judas, um, was also there, yes. And so Jesus' desire on this evening was to prepare them for what was ahead, even though they did not know and anticipate it. So we too have opportunities in our times of need to be prepared. And so the verse that's really the key verse in our scripture today is verse 24. The Son of Man will go just as it is written. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. The Son of Man is Jesus. He calls himself the Son of Man. Jesus has many titles, I think some 300 names. But you know, he is the Son of Man, and it's his favorite name and title. Why? Because it means that he's human. He's the son of man. He was born of Mary, offspring of humanity. He is fully man, but he's also fully God. And when I read some time ago that there are two candles on the altar represents the deity and the humanity of Christ, I now appreciate them even more. God, Jesus is God, fully God. And we will see this in this passage and so we see that um, <clears throat> there is a, in verse 24, uh, he is the son of man, and he will go just as it is written about him. There are many scriptures that proph prophesy the suffering servant. And in Isaiah 53 and other uh, scripture, it all talks about the suffering servant, that servant is Jesus Christ. Much has been written about him. And interestingly enough, we also know that in Psalm 41, verse 9, 
Psalm, yes, Psalms, right? David wrote Psalms a thousand years before Jesus comes along. Listen to this Psalm, Psalm 41, verse 9. Even my close friend, the one I trusted, who shared with my bread, has turned against me. I think we all know who this one is, isn't it? Don't we? That Judas Iscariot. Already in Psalm 41, verse 9, the scriptures speak of him, and it is written about him, and all that is written about him will be fulfilled, because the God's word is true. But woe, woe to the man. Woe to the man. Woe is a declaration of definite judgment. And that judgment will come on the man who betrays the Son of Man. Judas has been judged. You know, when we look at this scripture, if we turn up, uh, well, let's uh, go to verse 17. It was the first day of the festival of the unleavened bread, Passover. This is the first day is the Passover day. And the disciples came together, to Je uh, came to Jesus, and they asked him. And we know from the Gospel of Luke that the two disciples were Peter and John. By the way, when you e read the Easter, Easter narrative, it's good to read it in the different Gospels because each one has a different perspective and includes some details that the other ones don't. It gives us a much better picture. So Peter and John, the two disciples, they came to Jesus. So where do you want us to make preparations for the Passover? The Passover meal was commemorative of the Jewish uh, deliverance from Egypt by the hand of God. They looked past and they knew that God rescued them as a people. And then when they enjoyed this meal, they recognized that God feeds them with this meal. And there were herbs and there was unleavened bread and they were, there was salt reminding them of the salty tears that they had shed in their time of slavery. The unleavened bread, the hastiness of coming out, the blood that was shed, the Passover lamb, the blood that covered the doorways so that the lamb of death judgment would pass over them. And they celebrated this Passover meal in a Jewish context, and there's a sequence of things and prayers and and rituals that has to be done in this Seder meal. Jesus used that, but when he came to the third cup, the cup of redemption, he said, this is the covenant of my blood. It wasn't just a Passover lamb, but it was his blood. In the Jewish context, there was a looking back, having been rescued. There was a feeding at the meal. There was the fellowship at the meal. And then in the Jewish context, the fact that one day they would be in the promised land. And Jesus used that last supper to identify himself with that bread and with that cup. It doesn't speak here of the Passover lamb. There was no meat. And in our scripture here. So where do you want to celebrate this? Well, uh, Jesus said, well, go into the city and you will see a certain man. Again, in, in Luke's account, uh, it says this man was carrying water. And you go to this man who's carrying water, which is unusual. So either God, J Jesus had prepared this uh, arrangement that he would be in this house of the owner of the man who carried the water. Or, or was a divine knowledge. Jesus prophesied, there will be a man. You go to him. You talk to him. He'll talk to the owner. Prepare the room upstairs, the upper room. And everything was prepared. And tell him, my appointed time has come. What is the appointed time? The time of his death. He knew. He had already told them three times that he would be betrayed. And that he would be on trial and that he would be crucified and that he would rise on the third day. They didn't understand that, but he had already told them. And now was the appointed time, the ordained time, the time of God. And he was going to celebrate with them the Passover. And so the disciples did as they were directed and they obeyed. Evening came, and they were reclining in verse 20. They were reclining. The room is uh, 
I have a couch. It's like uh, um, three walls. The couch is on the three walls. And they recline on this couch. And uh, there's a table in the middle in the shape of, a, of the letter U. And at the head of the table is Jesus. And the place of honor is on his left. And the place on his right is that also a place of honor. On his left, apparently, was Judas. On his right was John. Yes, Judas was on his left in the place of honor. And so as the meal goes on, he, uh, he drums a bob and shell. This is a time of intimacy. He knows his time is short even before the night is done and the day begins. He won't be much longer here around. And so he drops this announcement. Truly, truly, I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. I bet you the room was silent as it is now, just for a few moments. And then they were greatly distressed. They were greatly distressed because they had been together. They had been a gang, a band of brothers. And now, all of a sudden, they knew that he was spoken of his death. They remembered that. But now he twisted it even more. And he says, look, one of you is going to betray me. And what do they do in verse 22? They were distressed and they were very, very sad. And they said to one another, you don't mean me, Lord. It's not me, is it? Surely I'm not the one. Lord, Lord, Lord. You know, Bartholomew and then Thomas and James and two Jameses and two Simons and one after another and after another. Not me, not me, Lord, not me, Lord. Verse 25, and Judas, one that would betray him, he said, surely don't you mean me, Rabbi? Ooh, did you notice the difference? Judas said, Rabbi. The other said, Lord. Ah, there is no recording at all where Judas called Jesus Lord. When you say Lord, it means he's your master. You will do what he says. It is not your will, but his will that is called for. Rabbi, surely you don't mean me. And Jesus said, you have said it. In other words, you said it, it's you. Jesus saw right through him. And then as time went on, then he took the bread and the wine. When we go into the Gospel of John, we see a little bit more of the detail as to what's happening. In John chapter 13, you don't have to turn there, but you may listen. John 13, 21. After Jesus had said this, he, he said, um, truly, truly, I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. His disciples stared at one another at a loss to know which one he meant. So they're looking at each other. I wonder if it's this guy. I wonder if it's him. I wonder if it's him. Because it's not me. And one of them, the disciples whom Jesus loved, John, was reclining next to Jesus. And Simon Peter said, hey, John, ask him which one he means. Right? You're the beloved one. Sneak up. Like, who, who is it? Leaning back against Jesus, John said to him, Lord, who is it? Maybe low enough so that everybody else couldn't hear. And Jesus said, it is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. It's going to be the one who I'm giving this bread. Now, supposedly, they have this big bowl in the middle and it's filled with sauce. So it's filled with broth and it has maybe some herbs in it. And everybody has some bread and they dip in the common bowl. So at this time, probably everybody has dipped in. So who is it, the one who's dipped in the bowl? Well, everybody's done that. So who is it specifically? And then in John, uh, Jesus says, well, the one whom, um, the one, verse 26 in John 13, it is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I, ha when I have dipped it in the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, right there. And the son of Simon Iscariot. And as soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. 
The Bible speaks of the reality of Satan. The Bible speaks of the reality of Satan possessing, influencing, harassing. Satan entered into him. And so what does Jesus do? He says, what you're about to do, go ahead, do it quickly. Jesus knew. And no one at the meal understood why Jesus said to, this to him, do it quickly, go about. But John reminds us that Jesus was in charge of the money. And so maybe Jesus was telling him to go buy, um, to go pay for the food, or maybe give some money to the festival, I mean, to the poor. And as soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out and it was night. There was some debate whether Jesus, uh, Judas Iscariot was there on the night when they had the bread broken and shared the cup. I don't think he was there. I use this verse that he was there. He was not there for communion. Communion is for God's family. Those who have him as master and Lord in your heart. And so we see here that uh, there's a divine responsibility. There is also a human responsibility. And none of them are in conflict. God will accomplish his will and purpose through Jesus Christ our Lord. And yet there is the freedom to choose what we want to choose. The opportunities are there. Will you be faithful unto the Lord or will you be betray him? Will you bring shame? Judas Iscariot was with Jesus and the band of brothers for a long time. And he let this sin fester and fester and fester and fester. He had the light, but he always rejected it. He had the light, but he always rejected it. He was shown love, but he always rejected it. He was a pretender. You know, there are many people in churches or in, call themselves Christians, but are pretenders. They know the words, they know the prayers, they know the etiquette, but when you look in their hearts, Christ is not on the throne. We cannot judge. We do not know, only God knows. But the scriptures remind us that it is by our fruit that we will know. A good, fruit will have, a good tree will have good fruit. And that is why in Psalm 1, we're reminded there's a tree planted by the rivers of water that will bring forth great fruit. There is a way that leadeth unto righteousness, but the way of the wicked will be death. In Psalm 1, we are reminded that the wicked are like chaff. There is an outside part, but the inner is in there, so when you, when you blow at it, it doesn't stand. Judas was one of those. He must have been really good at being a spiritual hypocrite because people did not know that it was empty on the inside for three years. Here's a tough question. How well do you know your neighbor? How well do we know others? It is sad that in, this, in our news that many high-profile Christian leaders fall. Many we know have a good start, but don't finish the race. And so John's narrative tells us that Jesus, um, Judas took the morsel of bread and, and Satan entered in him. At the height of this loyalty and betrayal is when you're sharing a meal together in fellowship with a friend and then you turn on him. That's what G, uh, Judas did. This fellowship that they were enjoying, this friendship they were enjoying, he took this morsel, knowing full well that he was already betrayed him. The final straw fell, Satan entered him. Jesus, in giving him this morsel of bread, was extending a gracious act of hospitality, an act of friendship. We're going to eat bread together. And especially the bread that had been dipped into this common bowl of herbs and sauce and broth. And did you know it was also a high honor for the host to do the dipping of this priest of bread and give it to you as the honored guest? That's what Jesus did to Judas. 
Jesus gave him the bread. Judas accepted it, knowing full well what he was about to do. The great pretender, the deceiver. And so we see here that um, he left and uh, he went out into the night and he was truly in the dark in many, many ways. And so we see that after, in verse 26, back in Matthew 26, while they were eating, Jesus took the bread that he had given and he gave thanks. And he broke it and he, he gave it to his disciples and he said, take and eat, this is my body. He didn't take the meat of the Paschal lamb, he took the bread. And he took this ordinary bread, there was nothing special or powerful or um, thing about it, sacred about it, other than he took the bread and he made it a symbol, a metaphor, and the reality of that his body was the bread of life. Now that too would have been a shock. Are you saying, you know, your body is bread? Are we cannibals? No. But it is a symbol of his body, which was about to be broken on the cross. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and he said, drink it, all of you. This is the blood of the covenant. So this is the new covenant that God has given through Jesus Christ. Also prophesied in Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 31, verse 31. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. And with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah, I will not, it will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them. So God is a husband to Israel. Israel is his wife. God is our, Jesus is our groom. We are the bridegroom. We are their bride. In verse 33 in Isaiah 31, this is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel at that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. Remember the Pharisees were external. I'm going to put it inside your heart. These are heart issues, matters of the heart. Spiritual things matter. I will be their God and I will be and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor what to say to one another to know and understand the Lord because they will already know me because I will live in them. I am from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, and I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. This is the new covenant that Jesus was explaining. Of course, it wasn't fully understood. This is the blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. We see lots of things here. We see a promise of a Father's kingdom. We see the promise that his disciples will be with him in glory. This is not the end. And this fellowship that they enjoyed with the bread and the wine and the herbs, and they would continue this fellowship again in glory, in a new place, in a new way. The promise of future fellowship with God. And then when they had sung a hymn, one of the psalms, one of the halal psalms, psalms of praise, they went out into the Mount of Olives. And next week, we're going to look at Gethsemane. If you have a chance this week to read chapters 26 and 27, it talks about the upcoming suffering and the death of the Lord Jesus Christ and what he had to go through. And put yourself into the picture. Now, something that's really important. Last week, we talked about the sons of Jacob and remember, Judah means, the name Judah means praise. I was shocked to realize that the name Judas means praise. It ain't praising him. Judas means praise. God had chosen him for his purpose to glorify his name. He took the opportunity not to do so. 
He was a pretender. What do we learn from this? Let's not be pretenders. Let's be honest with God. Let's be honest with one another. Let's deal with what needs to be dealt with. You know, it's easier to take a little sapling of an oak tree out of your garden than to wait until it's like 100 years old and then try and get rid of the oak tree. Get rid of that sin when it's small. And ask God to forgive you. And ask God to cleanse you. Keep short accounts with him. And God is a God of blessing. You know, one final thought here is the fact that he knew he was going to the cross. This bread was his broken body. This cup was the new covenant in his blood. What did he do? Did he complain? <laughs> he gave thanks. He gave thanks. Are you giving thanks for the hardships that we are walking through? You're working through? In all things, give thanks. In all things, rejoice evermore. Why? Because God's in charge. And in everything, pray without ceasing. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, how gracious you are to extend your hand of love and grace and forgiveness and patience and kindness and goodness. Lord, we are astounded at your patience with Judas for those three years. You read him like a book. You, you knew all about him. And yet, time and time again, you extended your love and grace. There were many, many times that the light was shed, the love was shared, and the truth was spoken, and yet you did not go into the soil of his own heart. Lord, many times we are. Our behavior is like Judas, where we just are neglectful of what is really important. That uh, it's easy to hide our motives of why we do what we do and why we say what we say. It's easy to, to live life under the radar that nobody knows and nobody sees, and, but you see and you know, and there will be an accounting. And so we thank you for this warning that we have. Judas's life was a tragic example. And of all the blessings, of all the goodness, and yet not experiencing it fully to what, it, what you have given. And then we thank you for your faithfulness. Lord Jesus, you knew you were going to the cross. You knew that uh, you were going to be whipped and persecuted and spat upon. You knew that even that very night, um, you would be in agony praying, Lord, not my will, but thy will be done. And so you remain faithful. You remain faithful to the calling. You kept your eyes not on the circumstances, but on the one who controls the circumstances, your heavenly Father and our heavenly Father. Spirit of the living God, take the truth of your word and, and place it in, the, in our hearts and in our minds where it needs to be put today. You're the master teacher. You're the one that frees us you're the one who makes us fruitful, and you're the one that keeps us faithful. When we are faithless, you remain faithful. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us sing our closing hymn, and uh, it is a prayer. My faith looks up to thee. Oh.